Uh, so welcome everyone. My name is Gabrielle O'Brien and my pronouns are she and her. I'm the Senior Project Officer responsible for this event and representing the ADSET team. On behalf of ADSET, I want to welcome all of you to this inaugural UDL symposium titled UDL in Action, the what, the why, and the how of UDL. ADSET is committed to the self-determination of First Nations people. We acknowledge the Palawa and Pakana people of Lutrawitta, upon whose lands ADSET is hosted. I also want to pay my respects to the Turrbal, Yogura and Gubby Gubby people where I am today in Mianjin, Brisbane. And I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the lands across Australia wherever our participants may be. I pay my deep respect to Elders past and present and welcome all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining today. With the announcement of the date of the 2023 referendum on the voice to parliament, it is a good time to reflect on what we can do to support First Nations people at this politically charged time. ADSET hopes its commitment to the voice can contribute to the future in a positive way. Now for some housekeeping. Please note requirements for captioning and etiquette for all sessions to run smoothly are in the chat and on the ADL symposium website at www.adset.edu.au forward slash UDL symposium. This information, this session is being recorded. Please turn off your camera and mic for the session. Please use the Q&A function to pose questions to the speaker. Ensure your surrounding environment is quiet if you're attending um, workshop sessions. Don't forget to tag us on socials with the hashtag UDL Symposium 2023. And don't forget we have more poster presentations on the ADSET website. And you'll be provided all session recordings and notes um, on the ADSET website um, after the symposium. So for many years, ADSET has been a proponent of UDL as a way to transform learning and teaching for the betterment of people with disability. To support the tertiary education sector, we have developed a range of resources and activities to assist educators, learning designers and others to implement a UDL approach. This has included an e-learning module, web resources, webinars and a community of practice. Now we are excited to host this inaugural symposium to showcase the good practice in Australia and nationally, uh, internationally. We are very pleased to kick off this symposium with today's special guest speaker, Dr. Cheryl Bergstahler. Cheryl's achievements are too many to mention in such a short time frame, so I encourage you to view her um, biography on the program website. Now I'm pleased to hand over to Cheryl, who will be talking about how applying a UDL framework can lead to tertiary education that is accessible and inclusive. Over to you, Cheryl. Thank you so much. I've been to Australia several times and I wish I was there right now. I'm actually in Seattle, Seattle, Washington. Uh, and here it's uh, Monday evening. Uh, so our time uh, is a little bit different at time of the day, but I'm so happy to be with you. And it's so wonderful that we have technology where that is actually possible. I go by she, her pronouns. And again, my name is Cheryl Bergstaller. My email address is on the screen and it's in chat as well, but I'll read it. S H E R Y L B at uw.edu. And I wouldn't give out my email address if I didn't expect you to contact me. Maybe not all of you, uh, but if you have a question or you'd like to, to comment on something that I talked about or extend the conversation or look for resources, this is a topic I really care about. And so I'd be happy to talk to you. I'm going to take kind of a, a bird's eye view of universal design, going beyond universal design for learning and seeing how it fits in a broader landscape of universal design applications. And then there'll be a lot of sessions and the keynote uh, at the on the next day of this program, uh, more zeroed in on the UDL uh, part of what I'm talking about today. So I direct two units under accessible technology services. My two units are, first of all, the IT accessibility team, um, and that team is funded by the University of Washington. It's been funded since 1984. And our job there is to make sure that the University of Washington procures, develops, and uses techno technology that's accessible to everyone, including people with disabilities, which could be faculty, students, staff, and even our visitors, like visitors to our websites. I would like to say we do a perfect job of all this, but of course we don't, or it's, it's a journey. 
um, but we uh, strive to reach those goals and make sure that we are fully inclusive and accessible to all of our uh, people in our community that have disabilities. And so again, that's focused on the University of Washington. So of course it's funded by the UW, which is a state funded institution of higher education. Uh, I'll be using higher education and post-secondary as you use tertiary. Um, and uh, so yeah, you'll hear I'll be using a little bit different terminology, but I think we all know the same that they mean the same thing. Then I have the Do It Center. Disabilities, Opportunities, Internetworking, and Technology. I started this program in 1992 uh, because I wanted to do something beyond just focusing on technology. It's not just enough for people with disabilities to have access to technology, like assistive technology, and even access to accessible technology um, as well. Uh, but there are other things, uh, the support of students with disabilities to get prepared for college and, and employment and so forth. So I wanted to take a little more holistic view. And that was beyond my job description. And so like a lot of institutions, maybe yours, the people that live their passion usually go out and get their own money. And so I started doing that back in 1992, started with a large grant, multi-million dollar grant from the National Science Foundation. So many of our programs are focused on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields, which isn't a bad idea because those fields uh, create many accessibility challenges, but also uh, lucrative uh, careers for people that, that where people with disabilities are underrepresented. So much of our funding still comes from the National Science Foundation, but we also get state funds from Washington State, corporate funds, private funds, and so forth to fund all of the work that we do in the Do It Center. We even have a program in Japan at the University of Tokyo that does many of the same things as we do in the Do It program that started in 2007, uh, after uh, two visiting scholars from the University of Tokyo came to visit our program for a year. Um, and later we funded this Center on Universal Design and Education, which is all about what we're talking about today. Uh, that was in 1999, funded by our US Department of Education, but also in each grant proposal that I write uh, to the National Science Foundation, Department of Education, and otherwise, I will always say that the resources we create will build um, that resource. And so we didn't, uh, you know, we had 10 years of funding from the Department of Education, but we still continue to update and, um, and add new resources. So you might want to take a look at that. Um, that resource will have a URL at the end of the slides. Two projects are particularly relevant to what I'm talking about today. And one of them is NNL. You'll see that at the bottom of the screen. Now uh, it's neuroscience for neurodiverse learners. And so we're really focusing on students who have on the autism spectrum or have some learning disabilities, attention deficits, and other um, issues that affect the way that they, they approach learning and they learn things. Um, and so that's a very interesting project to focus on that particular area. We're always con conscious of an intersectionality though. And so we might have a student who's on the autism spectrum who also might be blind or use a wheelchair or have other types of disabilities. And I, I'm also talking about things that are related to access computing. That's a project that's been gone, going on well over 10 years now, funded by different grants from the National Science Foundation to increase the participation of people with disabilities in computer careers, computer and IT careers, also to work with faculty to make sure that they can accommodate students with disabilities in their computing classes, and also help faculty learn how they can include at universal design topics within their curriculum. So our computer science graduates will leave with degrees and also a knowledge about how to design accessible products. Because in the United States, there's a big push from um, uh, Microsoft, Google, Amazon for hiring people that know something about accessibility, which is a wonderful development. But unfortunately, not all our faculty have caught up and are teaching accessible design in those classes. So we work on a number of different areas. When we're working with students, many of our programs, we have students with disabilities, we take the promote uh, the, uh, the approach of, of, of self-determination, uh, the idea, the broad idea uh, in helping students with disabilities get the skills they need, the knowledge they need, the resources, the networking, all the things that they need uh, to make decisions in their life so they can be in charge of their life, get the resources they need and be successful in the areas that they choose to pursue. But today we're talking more about working with faculty and staff and institutions and technology companies. And there we're always promoting, promoting the practice of universal design. So if we're working with technology companies, we're helping them make their products more accessible uh, to people with disabilities. 
So um, what I'm thinking about today is I think we need a paradigm shift. We just need to think differently. A paradigm, by a paradigm meaning kind of the way we think about things at our institutions of, of higher education. Uh, what do we think about? So, um, so uh, changing from what to what? Well, from excluding groups of students who should be able to participate in something uh, to be more inclusive. Um, to we, if we create barriers for them getting into uh, career fields like computing and IT, um, that's really unfair. And so how can we open those doors and be more inclusive? From design for the average student to design for everyone, to be thinking not just, well, who is likely to be in my class and what's their background going to be and how old are they going to be and so forth, but just thinking about all students who might show up in our classes, including those students at the margins. Uh, it, rather than just, just just think of average, but think, well, what are some of the outliers, some of the students that might be in my class? For instance, in the area of technology knowledge, some may, you might think, well, all, stu all students know a lot about technology now. Well, not all of them do. And so we need to address those students that, that aren't uh, technology savvy to make sure that they can come up to speed and be successful in our classes. From a reactive reliance on accommodations alone to a proactive universal design of accessible, inclusive, and sustainable products environments and services. By sustainable, I mean we create a class that can be used uh, for all students and then uh, perhaps have some students with accommodations, but make them ex as accessible as possible on the front end. They're born accessible is what we can call that. And so therefore they're sustainable. In our country, many times we provide accommodations by, in terms of uh, document redesign so the documents will be accessible maybe to students who are blind who have learning disabilities. But we don't use those new developed materials in the next version of the class. It only goes to the student. And so if another student comes in and needs accessible materials, then we do it all over again. So we want to avoid that and create sustainable products, environments, and services. But once upon a time, there was a time we, including you and us and a lot of the different countries, uh, we already did this. Um, and it was in the physical environment. And so uh, right now I have on the screen a, a picture that appeared on the front page of a student newspaper here at the University of Washington in Seattle in 1970. And here we have a young man in a wheelchair in a crowded area walking with, with uh, next to other students. Uh, and he has a large sign on his back of his wheelchair. And it's in all capital letters, which to me that says he is shouting to everyone who will listen. Ramp the curbs, get me off the street. Back in 1970, that was very contra controversial. University of Washington, as in other schools in the United States, pushed back on that. We're a ve very hilly campus. We have a lot of sidewalks and we're really old and we have very high curbs. And so people would say, how expensive is that going to be? And how many students really do we have in wheelchairs? How can we afford to do such things? Well, some people recognized, well, they should have put curb cuts in them in the beginning uh, so that people in wheelchairs could use those curb, use those sidewalks rather than be out on the street and trying to find ways into getting into buildings and ties onto sidewalks and so forth. And now it's common practice. So something that was controversial and just thought of as something that a person with a wheelchair would use, now we all use sidewalks with curb cuts. So it's just an expectation in our neighborhoods that there will be curb cuts. And who uses them? People pushing baby stro strollers and delivery carts and everybody else. I think people with wheelchairs are kind of in the minority of the people that use those curb cuts. And so it benefits everyone. Now, wouldn't it be nice in our courses if the same thing happened? And maybe it will, but that should be our vision. Maybe it won't be reality um, ever, but it might be, where it's just assumed that when you de develop a course, it is made to be accessible to people with disabilities as well as other students. I like to think of ability rather than disability and ability on a continuum. Everyone in this presentation today, hundreds of us, could rate ourselves individually on this double-edged arrow here from not able on the left to able on the right. Um, and we would all be able to, to, um, to rate ourselves and come up with a little list of our characteristics. And my guess, we wouldn't find any two of us that match. So we can take a look at the ability to understand English. Uh, some, one person might have a, a difficulty understanding English because English is not their first language. Another person might have difficulty understanding language, ing, ling, uh, English because of a learning disability that affects their ability to do so. And so again, it, it could be a disability or it could be some other reason. And you could rate yourself maybe a little lower than other people might rate themselves. Social norms. We know students on the autism spectrum have difficulty picking up social cues. And so they have to often be taught uh, what other people just to see, seem to pick up naturally. 
But there are other people that might rate themselves low, a little lower than others on social norms. And that would be people that grew up in different cultures. And so they're learning the new norms in the country that they're, they're now in. So all these other characteristics as well, the ability to see uh, on a continuum. A person might have a, a, in this presentation uh, an inability to see this presentation. It could be because they're blind. It could be because they have their video turned off because they don't have a reliable internet connection. It could be because they're just in a location, maybe driving a car and they're just listening to the top uh, or to the, to, the, um, to the audio. And so, so that's why I mentioned here that there's a double-edged arrow all the way from not able to able, because I am assuming when I'm giving this talk that some of you don't see the screen and I'm giving you just enough information so you can see what I'm talking about. That's universal design. The ability to hear or walk or read print, write with a pen or a pencil, communicate verbally, tune out distraction, learn, manage physical and mental health. These are all abilities and there are many, many more that I could list and we could all rate ourselves. And again, the point is we don't have just one common model of what a human being looks like, even the average human being. Um, and so we need to accept diversity as just an ability as we do other diversity characteristics of human beings. Now, when we look at accommodations, when we're looking at accommodation model, it's helpful to notice what, what some of the more expensive one is, at least what we're experiencing here in the United States, and that may be common in Australia and other countries as well. Some of the more common expensive accommodations in online courses, um, particularly in the pandemic, are first of all, making inaccessible documents accessible, uh, mainly re reformatting PDF files. PDF files tend to be um, difficult to make accessible. They can be. Uh, some of you probably know how to do that. But if you don't, it's more difficult to create a, an accessible PDF file than it is to create, say, a Word file or even, uh, even a HTML uh, document. Or that's HTML, hypertext markup language, is the language of the internet uh, for web pages. But it also is for like in your content management uh, uh, program where you have a content page. Um, that is in HTML that you're using there, and that's easier to make accessible than a PDF. And so what happens is a lot of uh, uh, faculty members put their, their syllabus in a PDF, um, and then they uh, format, and then they have to be reformatted. So if they did them in an accessible format, we'd never have to provide that accommodation. Captioning videos is another one. Many of our faculty put their videos up on YouTube, but they don't realize uh, that they can edit those captions and make them accurate. And that, of course, is important for a lot of people, including student, students who are deaf. So if we just made those accurate captions on all the videos we've used in our classes, that would be universal design. It no longer would be um, an accommodation that would have to be provided. So universal design, you may have a different definition. I like the one, the original one from the Center on Universal Design at North Carolina State University, which applies to any product or environment. The design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. So we should think about the diversity of people in our classes and how we can make it whatever we're doing, uh, designing a class or uh, presenting materials or whatever, accessible to everybody. The three characteristics of universal design of any type are it's technically accessible, that would be technically accessible to someone who has a disability, Usable, that also means that it's easy to use. You can figure out what to do. You can perform all the functions. You can navigate um, on a website and so forth. And then inclusive as well, that in, whenever possible, we create products that everyone can use. So students, for example, can work side by side. A, a quick example in the uh, physical environment as what it means to be inclusive is represented by the two pictures I have. On the screen right now, on the left-hand side, we have one that we would call Americans with Disabilities Act compliant. It meets all the, the, the standards to be ADA compliant. Uh, two steps into the, the front door of this pretty modern building. And then to the left, we have a, a, a ramp. It has handrails. It's ADA compliant in, for our standards here in the United States. But on the right-hand side, we have uh, something that goes beyond ADA compliance to be more inclusive. On the left, 
if I'm walking next to someone using a wheelchair, they'll go one way and I go the other. We'll meet at the top, but it's going to interrupt our conversation. On the right, we have another building here at the University of Washington that has just a gradually sloping lamp, ramp into the building. That's the main entrance to the building. Notice that ramp is really wide as well. So my colleague using a wheelchair and I can walk side by side to go into that front door. We don't have to have our uh, communication interrupted and it's wide enough that people can pass us on the other side. Uh, there are many steps in this building. Uh, you can find them, you can use them, but the main entrance is the one that's most, most accessible and inclusive. So looking at um, a framework, um, and you can, I'll give you some resources to look this up, but we only have a few more minutes here, so I'm not going to go into detail. I created a framework, the Universal Design in Higher, in higher Education Framework, where we have a scope, uh, we have definition, I already gave the definition, and then there are principles, guidelines, practices, and process. We'll go through a few of those things. One thing to think about is the diversity of our students with respect to race, ethnicity, cultural background, sexual identity, socioeconomic level, age, marital status, religious beliefs, values, academic interests, work experience, and specific abilities that we already talked about. So a lot of range of, of people in our classes. And then the scope, you could be looking at all applications in education or tertiary education. Uh, you could be looking just at instruction. There's gonna be a lot of focus on instruction in this these two days of this, this program. Services like career services and so forth, the technology design um, of things you create on your campus, like we do in our one unit um, that I mentioned already, the physical spaces or the products or uh, conference exhibits, presentations. We're making our presentations in these sessions accessible to people with disabilities, the, the files and so forth that you can access, and even professional organizations and lots of other things. An example, when you look at universal design of technology, just think of your smartphone. It builds in accessibility features. We can change the foreground and background and text size and our, our phones can even talk to us. Mine a little bit too much, by the way. Um, but also we wanna make sure that these devices are um, a, a compatible with any other assistive technology that people with disabilities might be using, like a braille embosser for a person who's blind or when they want to have a hard copy so they can produce things in braille. Uh, there are multiple beneficiaries of universal design. We'd already talked about videos a bit, but when you think about videos that have uh, good, solid, accurate captions, who do they benefit? Certainly people who are deaf and cannot hear, but also English language learners. Uh, when you think of it, it's kind of a mean trick if you don't have accurate captions on your videos uh, and you have ones that are maybe have misspelled words and no punctuation and so forth for an English language learner. Um, also, people who are in a noisy environment, like an airport or a noiseless one, like a library, and they want to uh, watch a video and turn off the sound, um, slow internet connections, they want to know the spelling of words, that's pretty much everybody, um, and they need to find the content uh, quickly, because there are ways to search through a collection of videos through those captions and find specific content, just like a Google search for text. Now there are three sets of principles that I that underpin my my uh, framework for universal design in higher education or other applications as well that I really think um, are relevant to education. There are other principles out there, by the way, uh, for the universal design of homes, uh, so people can live in homes uh, as they age and reduce function. Uh, but these three are particularly relevant. There are the seven original principles of universal design that go along with that definition I brought uh, on the screen a while back. Um, and they kind of, they, they can help you with a physical space, like is there a space for uh, moving in an environment uh, for people who are left and right-handed and other, other things usable um, and so forth. Um, and those are basic principles that apply to anything, um, but particularly the physical space. And then the three principles of universal design for learning that you're going to talk a lot about on these two days. And then there are actually four principles for the universal design of information technology, for the IT that we use, those learning management systems, and the, as I said, the modules within them and so forth. And those four principles too can be used to underpin what we're doing. And they also underpin the web content accessibility guidelines that are used worldwide for the design of websites and other IT. Now, I'm just going to fast forward and say what I think, if you apply all three sets of principles, what happens in an educational setting? Well, first of all, you provide multiple ways for your participants, which would be your students, to learn, to demonstrate what they've learned, and to engage. And so, for instance, you're teaching a topic, you have a video that presents that material, you have something that they can read uh, to learn about that material. 
um, to demonstrate what they've learned, a lot of different ways to um, test and, uh, and to evaluate the students' learning, and then different ways to engage in the class as well. But then there's another thing, which means to ensure that the technologies, the facilities, the services, the resources, the strategies are accessible to individuals with a wide variety of disabilities. That's why we need UDL plus these other sets of, of um, principles as well. So for instance, the one example I gave, if you uh, have the video and you have the handout, sometimes people think that's enough. And sometimes even people that are practicing UDL. But I don't think it's enough if you look at UD more broadly. You need to go back at that video and make sure it has accurate captions and is otherwise accessible to people with disabilities. And then you need to look at that material. Is it designed in a way that it's accessible to someone who's blind and using a screen reader, perhaps to read the text on the screen, or someone who has a learning disability that uses similar technology, simpler technology to um, convert text to speech. So that's important as well. So what do we have to do? Well, when considering, considering the course, uh, consider the characteristics of students who might attend and the assistive technologies that they might be using. And I have actually four people I'd like to introduce to you. And if you made your course accessible to these four people, then it's gonna be accessible to most people that might be in your class who have uh, disabilities. Um, uh, they also have different characteristics as far as their English language skills and their cultures and interests and comforts in using technology and the environments and uh, abilities and so forth. Um, but I'm going to focus on the disability. Here we have Zane. These are all people that are associated with the Do It program. Uh, Zane is deaf. So we need to make sure that we provide audio uh, uh, or text descriptions for any audio that we're using. That's important for her. Anthony has multiple physical disabilities and he does not have a usable voice. And there are thousands of assistive technologies available to him uh, to operate a computer and a telephone um, and other things. He has a large print or large uh, keyboard uh, with large um, buttons on it that he can, that he can uh, actually suppress because he does have some uh, uh, motor skills that allow him to press those keys as long as they're very large. Um, he has uh, software that can help him convert his, his uh, written material into um, vocal uh, material so that he can uh, use his interface with a telephone so he can talk to people on the telephone. He can compose the message and he has a synthesized voice that he can use. Very important because this young man has a really important job in technology where he's given consulting to parents of children newly diagnosed with conditions similar to his and will be using the technology he is. And it's really an inspiration to them to see what he's using. So what do you have to know about that if you're creating a website or a course or something? Well, Anthony can do everything everyone else can do on a keyboard, but he can't always do everything we can do on a mouse. And so there's just that one thing, it's a little more complicated than I'm saying, but simply make sure that whatever you're doing, a pull down menu or whatever technology you're using can be fully operated with the keyboard alone. You don't have to learn about all those technologies, you just need to know about that limitation. Then there's Jessie. Jessie has multiple learning disabilities. So she, she uh, composes her thoughts um, using dictation software, but then she also has to have it read back to her with text to speech. She's somebody that's going to be, who's going to have a difficult time using a PDF that's not designed to be accessible, especially if it's just a scanned in image where it looks like text to most of us who have sight, but it really is a text. It's just picture of text. And so her text to speech software can't use it. So she's going to have to have that material modified. Um, and so what we have to do for her, make sure those PDFs, those web pages that we have in our learning management system pages and uh, Word documents and other documents are text, have, have text within them, not just images of text. Then there's Hadi. Hadi actually works for me and he's, uh, he actually teaches online. And so he needs to have access to things as well. So he's totally blind. And he also, like Jesse, needs to have access to the text, but he needs more than that for a screen reader because he needs a, a, to know what the heading structure is, heading one, heading two, heading three, and lists when he's presented with a list and so forth and tables. And so he needs that extra formatting so that the, the computer can tell him uh, what he's, that he's encountering in the list or it's the heading two or heading one or whatever. So think about those four people. I'll just highlight some of the things I'm doing in my presentation today. I used uh, Microsoft PowerPoint. Uh, I used a template, a standard template, which te they tend to be more um, accessible and guide you in the right direction. Google Docs, for instance, if you do Google Slides, much more difficult to make accessible. 
So choose a good tool. I spoke the critical content presented on the slides. I designed an accessible PDF document or PowerPoint document, which I have a text format, structured headings, lists, tables, um, alternative text for the images, uncluttered slides, plain, plain, plain backgrounds, high contrast with the text, spelling out acronyms, using uh, avoiding jargon. Additional tips for online courses, point students to specific resources to gain needed knowledge and skills. Like if there's certain technical skills they need for using Blackboard or Canvas, whatever you're using, tell them where they can get started if this is the first course that they've taken with you at technology. Recognize and avoid cultural ability and other assumptions. Um, examples and assignments that are relevant to a diverse audience. Offer multiple ways to learn, demonstrate learning and engage. Um, caption the videos, of course, accurately. Avoid long lectures and massive slide decks. Chunk up the content and organize it with headings. Overview at the beginning, summary at the end. Use outlines and other scaffolding tools to help the students follow what you're doing. Simplify and break down images and tables. Avoid strict cameras on uh, policy. We like students to have our cam their cameras on, but it can create a great deal of fatigue if you require them to have their cameras on all of the time, particularly students who have anxiety issues. Use clear instructions, make your expectations clear, provide adequate time for practice, even give students ideas that they can do for more practice than you're providing to the other students. Um, make sure there's adequate time for your activities in your text. Provide feedback on parts of a very large assignment and corrective opportunities. Use small number of technology tools. Don't bring in every gadget on earth, especially new tools. Um, make sure they operate with a keyboard alone, but adding that extra overhead for students to learn the technologies can be a challenge for some students too. Avoid PDFs. Uh, you can take workshops and learn how to make them accessible. That's fine, but you can just simply avoid them. I teach online classes. I don't use PDFs. Use accessible HTML, HTML in the content pages. Um, Use descriptive wording for hyperlinks. Hadi, when he goes through a website, his uh, screen reader is so smart, it can go from the link to link and tell him what is at the link. So if you like to use click here, click here, click here on all your links, that's exactly what he hears. He has to go back and read all the surrounding text to figure out what he's linking to. So just have descriptive wording there. Say, do it website, uh, web content accessibility guidelines. That is the underlined linked text. Um, and so also the text, alternative text for images. So in summary, uh, what is universal design? Well, it's an attitude, an attitude that you want to include everybody in your class and you're willing to prepare ahead of time, a framework, which I presented, a goal, and you'll probably never reach it totally, but you have the goal of making your course fully accessible and a process kind of systematically going through and figuring out what you can do to be accessible. It values diversity, equity, and inclusion. It promotes best practice practices. It absolutely does not lower standards. If you're lowering your standards because of it, that's not universal design, it's something else. It's proactive, can be implemented incrementally. Don't, have everything, don't do everything all at once. Maybe do one for one term, do one thing, fix all your videos or something. But um, whatever you do, it's going to benefit everyone and it'll minimize the need for accommodations. So on our last slide here, I just have some resources. You'll see the URLs are in the in your um, uh, chat. And so you can look up the look those up. I'll just briefly say what they are here. One is to the do it page. We have lots of resources there. Um, I'm a great believer in when you get money from the federal government, particularly to put resources out there to benefit other people. So we have lots of resources. And I'm, the two projects I mentioned, Access Computing and NNL, you can link to those if you want to know more about that uh, from the Do It website. And there are a lot of resources. There are videos, publications. We even have free stickers and line drawings. I had some line drawings in my presentation today. We have a large collection of them and give you permission to use them in your presentations or your publications. Um, and then there's part of the Do It website is the Center for Universal Design and Education I mentioned, which has the UD framework all spelled out, um, as well as things like equal access, universal design of instruction with a lot of examples, 20 tips for teaching an accessible online course, and links to lots of articles that have been published in the, uh, in the literature about universal design in higher education or tertiary education, right? Um, and then the Accessible Technology website, um, um, we also have the URL here too. And don't forget, you can contact me, Cheryl B at uw.edu. You also might want to look up my book, Creating Inclusive Learning Opportunities in Higher Education, a Universal Design Toolkit. So we're ready to move on to Q&A.
Thanks, Cheryl. That was fabulous and, and perfectly timed as well. Um, so I'll just ask all participants to not be shy and put their questions in the Q&A um, panel. But the first question is from Elizabeth Hitches. What would be your favourite tip for engaging with UDL for the first time? Wow, favourite tip. One thing I was, it was kind of where I would start and kind of the same thing. Uh, when people say, wow, how should I get started? One thing you can do is think about the first week of your course or even two weeks. Uh, because if you're not making things fully accessible, that student is going to have to go to the disability services office to get accommodations like reformatting their videos or their documents. And so make sure whatever you're doing the first week or two is fully accessible if you want to start somewhere. Um, and um, I think that, um, wow, that's, that's kind of hard to even say. I think uh, documents are a good place to start. Your materials, you know, so you've got your content and your content management pages, those make sure you've used the heading structure and all heading one, heading two, all LMSs have them. So do that. Think of the document for your syllabus. Um, I would avoid putting in a PDF. I like to use a Word document myself. I put it in the content management page. Um, and then I also have it as a Word document. I don't have very many other attachments in my class, but I like the attached syllabus because they can download it to their desktop and I ask them to, to edit it, you know, add notes, add things to the timeline um, and so forth, and even take out things that, that don't apply to them. Um, and so looking at your documents throughout is another good way to start. And start at the beginning of the class. Don't you forgive yourself for not doing everything. There still is a disability services office that can provide accommodations. Just make sure every term you're, a student would need fewer uh, accommodations. Great, thanks, Cheryl. Um, so the next question um, is from Amber. Uh, in your university, how are staff with their own accessibility requirements like Hardy supported to implement UDL in their teaching? Examples, selection, creation of images or figures in a presentation. I wouldn't say they have a great deal of support uh, for helping them teach their classes. Um, Hadi does teach online. Uh, he's not teaching online right now, but he used to be do quite a bit of it. And I, I don't know how much support at his last school uh, he received for that. Support in general for faculty, though, who have disabilities like Hadi, he can get support for that through a disability services office uh, that's designed for faculty. And that comes out of our human resources uh, department. Uh, we have a different disability uh, services for the students. So he could go there. And in theory, if he was needing some support to use Canvas, which is our learning management system, he should be able to get some support from that office. We do have a blind professor at uh, one of our branch campuses, and he's actually supported by Hadi uh, because he has some difficulty using his uh, screen reader. And Hadi is a real expert at that, and they're using the same screen reader. And one thing that in his support in using Canvas, this other professor, as Hadi describes to me, is sometimes he thinks he's having trouble with Canvas, but really he's not using a feature within JAWS, his learning, his uh, screen reader, that would make Canvas accessible to him. And so there's that interaction there, which can be very complicated. Um, and so for a blind professor that's learning how to teach online, uh, they really can benefit from working with another blind uh, person who knows how to do that. That's great to, that's great to know. Um, it, it, it is. It can be quite challenging here as well to support um, staff with um, different types of disabilities as well. Um, so another a, another set of attendees have said, what has been the biggest resistance for implementing or explaining UDL um, to educators? The biggest is um, lack of time, um, feeling like this is beyond what they should do as a faculty member. And um, I give a lot of talks on our campus to faculty. And when they bring that up, um, I say to them, well, let's think about this for a minute. What do you faculty members do in other cases when you need more support um, or you feel like from your department? You get resources. I, most of the departments and colleges have IT support now. They didn't um, probably 10 years ago. 
And so I said, what you need to think about is where the support needs to come from. Who needs to do what? For instance, our business school has worked with my unit, and they decided that they're going to caption all, uh, all the videos for faculty members who teach online. It's a huge business school, lots of faculty. They integrated that into the process of them teaching their, or creating their online courses, and it's, it's part of their IT support. And so you could ask your department, think, well, what, what could you do uh, to help us? And that was a big burden taken off individual faculty members. Imagine all the faculty members that do not have to learn how to do that. Um, it's just automatically done. Um, business school has a lot of money, by the way, compared to some of the other departments. Keep that in mind. Another department, the social work department, has decided to have a central person that helps them, helps their faculty with document design. And they will reformat, uh, uh, they'll create accessible documents for our faculty like PDFs and, and uh, even HTML documents and so forth. So they've removed that burden. Uh, the College of Education, through their IT department, has a very comprehensive now training program for faculty. And faculty in education tend to uh, adopt UDL very easily because of their interests and so forth, but they also provide this, this additional support. So what I see is there are three levels of support. There's what you're doing as a faculty member. Um, there's a lot here on that list that you could just do tomorrow. It's not all hard. Okay. And then there's something where maybe we could get something from the department or the college. And then there's the central support. That's my group. And so we do a lot of the proactive uh, training, working with departments and so forth uh, to make sure that the technology we procure, develop and use at the university is accessible. By the way, we're using Zoom today. We uh, standardized on Zoom many years ago. My accessibility team was on the selection committee and voted against it. Small company, they had done nothing as far as accessibility. Where Microsoft Teams was another um, product, large company, a lot of accessibility support. Well, we got outvoted, often happens. So our next step is to get something in the contract that said they wanted, they voted for Zoom in the contract to uh, say that part of the contract is for them to work with my group to increasingly, to make their product increasingly accessible to people with disabilities. And so in our country, Zoom was perfectly in their right to make an inaccessible product. Universities are not supposed to purchase them because we're, we're required to make, to deliver accessible technologies to our faculty, students, and staff. And so we got on it. We spent a lot of time, my staff, we brought, to, brought other institutions in, the large university joined us to put pressure on Zoom, and they gladly took our, our advice. Zoom is recognized as the most accessible conferencing software in the world. Um, and it's because of the work of our institution and many others, they, were, they valued our, our contributions and continue to make things more accessible, getting captions better, getting uh, you know sign language interpreters to be able in the breakout rooms. And we've, we've got a list of things. And with these other institutions, as we prioritize them and help them decide what to work on next. And we, we're continually do that uh, day by day. Thank you, <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, we've got a couple of questions around mental health. So what um, developments do you see in UDL for those with mental health? Um, health um, challenges, including students um, who've got, say, social anxiety and operating either in a classroom or on an, in an online um, capacity. How, what can, how can UDL help those students? Yeah, the problem with a lot of students is, in our country anyway, most students who have disabilities, including mental health, do not disclose them. And so that's where UDL comes in because they don't have to disclose them to benefit from what you're doing. I did mention briefly not requiring students to be to uh, have their video on. Our faculty I know really like students to have their video on. I do too when I'm you know when I'm talking to my students, but um, but I'm I recognize that that is extra anxiety. I think we all feel it when I'm in a meeting and I'm just listening. Um, but I'm, you know, it's a meeting at, at work. There's extra anxiety. You've got to be presented on the screen. You have to look like you're paying attention. Uh, and it's, it, it's just a little extra anxiety. It doesn't bother me too much, but it does some people. So things like that um, can be helpful. I think really clear instructions um, and expectations can be helpful. I think being very welcoming to that student and others in the class 
by inviting them to meet with you if they have any concerns in the class to just be really open to uh, make it really clear that you would you'd like to meet with students you enjoy getting to know them anything that you can do to re reduce that that anxiety um, but being very specific about the requirements and the expectations can go a long way in that department also mm -hmm. being flexible in things like um, maybe um, attendance and that really depends on the instructor and what you're teaching and so forth. But sometimes you can, um, you know, make attendance might be required because they're doing things in class, but maybe one one forgiveness or something as far as that, or a way to wake, make things up if you miss something uh, to help reduce that anxiety as well. Great, Cheryl. Um, here's a tricky one. If you had unlimited funds and time, what's the next project you'd work on? Ooh. What's the next big emerging for me? For challenge? Me? Or for you or for, for UDL in general, for, or oh, for yeah, all yeah. of us? Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd spread spread the word about uh, increase the practice of UDL, but assuming that that isn't as creative as I should be thinking about. You know, the one that I, that is um, a top of mind for me, and I, I am seeking more money for, for doing this very thing, is I, I really have a compa uh, passion for helping faculty members in tertiary education, see, I remember, um, uh, actually teach relevant content about universal design or UDL in their classes. So I mentioned one example of that is computer science uh, faculty teaching about um, uh, how they can design accessible products, engineering classes, uh, engineering faculty, most of them don't talk about designing accessibly even if they use user-centered design, which is a common practice, they don't define the user broadly enough to include people with disabilities. People who are teaching history classes or even diversity classes, many of them, they don't even talk about people with disabilities and implications and so forth. And so that's my latest, one of my uh, my passions, and there's a lot of work to be done. The book that I wrote that I, that I mentioned, I devoted a whole chapter to it <laughs> in examples of how you can include universal design topics within uh, any you know, subject area. So, so that's something I'd like to get more money for. <laughs> Any well, ideas? Oh, <laughs> well, everyone's always looking for money, aren't they? Um, I know. And speaking of your book, um, we've had s some people say, looking forward to reading your book, but also would you have any other um, recommendations for other UDL leaders apart from yourself that, that people who are new to UDL should sort of invest time in reading? I, I'll tell you where you can find them. There, there are quite a number of them now. A couple of years, uh, five, 10 years ago, I could have named the few of us that were running around talking about these things. So I have on the uh, Center for Universal Design and Education um, in the, on the Do It website, uh, there is a link to articles uh, written uh, about actually universal design applications in higher education, tertiary education. And um, go to that link. And we keep this up um, regularly, like weekly, uh, when we find an article, a really good article, and we have them organized by dip different application areas like learning and, and uh, physical spaces and so forth. So that is the latest, greatest research, but also research to practice that you can find. And I'm learning about people in this field that I don't even know their names and they write these brilliant articles. Along those lines, if you go to our website, we have a community of practice there, if you search for communities of practices, we have a number of them, but one of them is the UDHE a community of practice. And that's a worldwide uh, email-based, very accessible um, community of practice. It's not one where you get a lot of chatting going on, but it's one where people share resources like that would answer the question also. Right, well, that, that'll give people a lot of reading to do. Um, yes. So another question we have is, what do you think about the responsibility of universities and colleges in providing the tools, software for faculties and academics to make the process of implementing UDL and accessibility sustainable within their workloads? It's a big question. Uh, that's a big issue. Um, we have a problem, even on our own institution, with all of my advocacy of uh, getting people to really buy into uh, even purchasing IT that is accessible to people with disabilities. And so we're even below the, that particular question and, and where we're working on. Um, I think there's a, a continual 
um, challenge in getting high level buy-in. It's easy to get uh, high level statements of buy-in to say, oh yes, we wanna include people with disabilities. Oh yes, we wanna do this. And there are different ways to do it. A sneaky way I did it is that in this book, uh, that we've been talking about. <laughs> uh, notice who wrote the um, the foreword. Uh, Anna Marie Cossey is the president of our institution. <laughs> and so I helped her write it. <laughs> and now I can go around campus and quote her. Don't say that. I, don't tell them over here that I was that <laughs> sound kind of sneaky. And it wasn't really bad. <laughs> I have a good relationship with her and she knew that what she she is very supportive of universal design when she has a, a chance to talk about things she's supportive so but you can find ways to kind of draw higher level administrators in our it organization i've worked there for over 30 years i've been around for a long time and um uh the different leaders have had different levels of interest in promoting universal design sometimes they've been sort of reluctant i think they think it's going to increase the chance we're going to get a lawsuit or a civil rights complaint or something which is just um, the opposite. They just don't want to think about it. Our newest one right now, my current my current leader is really uh, talking about universal design quite often. And even in a mission statement for my um, the unit the larger unit I'm part of, universal design is uh, is promoted as a, a best practice in uh, technology design, which is oh. amazing. So um, everywhere, everything, <laughs> all the time. And, um, <laughs> We all need to just talk about it and and be yeah. practical about it. I know when I teach faculty, uh, much like I did today, it was a pretty short presentation, but I give them a lot of easy things to do. You know, in a larger, larger, longer presentation, I'd go into a little more detail about some of them, but I like them to see, you know, use the heading structure. I mean, really, is that that hard to do? It's not hard to do. Now I've told you why it's good to do. Uh, so just do it and uh, do it when you're first grading a course, but go back and fix it. If you, you're, you're, you need, it, you can do it incrementally, just do it a little bit at a time, you know, and, and fix it. It's important. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. I think we've just got time for one more quick question. Um, how can we join the COPs, the communities of practice? Um, is it just, they go to the website and, and sign up? Yep. You go to the website, the do it website. Um, and it probably will, oh, I can't remember exactly where it is, where you can engage, um, how you can engage and you'll get it that way. But also if you just search, let's say, say communities of practice or community of practice, um, you will find a list of them. And for each one, it'll say how to join. Right. And it's very fantastic. That one, we kind of keep track of who's in there and what your, your uh, profession is and so forth. Because it is, we are kind of a community. We'll even share that list at times, so you know who else mm -hmm. is on there, what countries they're from, and so forth. Um, and so our leader, um, uh, Lila Crawford, she will get, she will be communicating with her, and she'll get that information for you, and then she'll put you on the list. Right. Well, we've had about four hundred people join this morning, so that'll probably add quite a few more people to your communities of practice. All um, right. But thank you so much, Cheryl, for your insights today. I hope everybody who's participated has gained something new from that. Um, thank you again, Cheryl, for having um, put the time aside on a, on a public holiday um, in the US. Um, and we really appreciate um, the information that you've provided to us. Um, yeah. You're getting lots of claps and hearts from everyone. And I, I think I share in that. Um, well, thank you for joining. <laughs> you can, you can um, probably tell I'm pretty passionate about this topic. It's not hard for me to get me to talk about it. <laughs> no, well, that's fantastic. It's great to have um, leaders like yourself um, do that sort of thing.